Welcome to Clean Radio. How you doing, Judah? I'm great. Here we are on our new 8 o'clock time slot. Yeah. Wow, we probably have some new listeners tonight. Hopefully. Yeah, people that aren't used to us at 10 o'clock. Following a political show. Right. Which is always fun. Because we're very political. Yes, because we're, <laughs> we're, we're extremely political. Exactly. And talking about sobriety and... Uh, addiction right we tend to upset people yeah we do tend to upset people but it is it's funny i mean it's not funny we were talking on the way here there is a lot of politics involved in the addiction field and and there's a lot of morality involved in politics and there's a (laughs) (laughs) so that was very profound it was wasn't it yeah it was extremely it was was extremely a new level for me yes and the number here is 877-8830-830 that's 877-8830-830 that was a new level of profoundness for you. I'm very proud of you. Yeah. So we have an exciting show. So for our new listeners that uh, may not have heard us there at 10 o'clock time slot, um, our show is about addiction and recovery, and we like to talk mostly about addiction issues of the day and relating to drugs, alcohol, and process addictions. Um, and then also we talk about- and a lot life, more exciting stuff than that. And we talk about life yes. in recovery. Yes. People that have gotten sober and- uh, And people that haven't. And people that haven't. And died <laughs> in uh, car- <laughs> crashes Clark, this is going to be our in their, hot, in their hot Porsche lead off topic why don't we introduce our well first, first of all today? I think I think Lindsay Lohan should be euthanized I'm going to come out <laughs> right and say this right away she serves absolutely no purpose to humanity or society wow, that's that's not exactly wow. sort of the loving message and that's not clean's with. opinion <laughs> <laughs> and my and just we always forget to say that in my opinions in no way have to do she's with she's been it. trying yeah. to euthanize herself it's yeah. called it's called drinking I say I say I say we help <laughs> I, <see what> you <laughs> I say we progress the progress the, the, the progress uh, the uh, process. process. Wow. Well, we have Eric Hahn in our studio tonight. Great, great uh, comedian. Thank you for having me. What's yeah. your last name? My last name is Hahn. H A H N. You didn't get that the whole ride down. No, no. we were, we actually had a really fun ride you down. You guys were holding hands the whole yes, ride down. You we actually were. Names, right? I went into the back seat <laughs> after I was sitting in the front seat. Wow. And um, it was a very entertaining. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it's that's exactly how clean treatment is, by the way. Just so you know, like if people ever wonder what the clean facility is like, it's a lot of good bantering going back and forth between people. It's a it's a friendly, fun place. And the ride was nice. I really yeah. appreciate that picking me up. Andrew, yeah, Andrew, Andrew, schlepping we're all the a full way to the service West radio show. Oh and a, yes, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> appreciate it. But yeah, so okay, so let's get on topic. Yeah, because you know, so, you know, this we guy, have this eight o'clock time. This guy died. Now. This guy died in a drunk driving accident. Ryan Dunn from Ryan Jackass. Dunn from Jackass yeah. crashed his uh, Porsche going 130 miles an hour. Right. See, this didn't surprise me. Well, but a blood is... alcohol level of 1.9. No, it didn't surprise me. It d- d- doesn't surprise me either. What's sad though is that he had a, somebody else in the car with him. Right. You know, that served our country, did three terms, you know. Who was also drunk. Who was also drunk. Right. And uh, that doesn't make it any better. But uh, who was it that predicted, like, you know, one of the, one of his friends, you know, had him in a dead pool of dying in a in a, in a a drunk driving accident? Right. And, you know, you well, see. Bam had predicted it. Right. Like, and you well see Bam Margera. Also, you see him there. Like, and I don't mean to be flippant about this, but you see Bam Margera. You know, doing this eulogy basically at the site, crying. Ben Margera, who's also had a DUI, right? <laughs> you know, drunk on TV, right? Who, who will probably be next on the list right. to die in a, you know, and it's it's it, it's sad, but that's what happens. I but always I always thought drunk driving was one of those things where everybody knows you shouldn't do it, but it's like using a you, condom. You have to do it. Like you, when I in my drinking days uh, in Ohio, you had to drive everywhere you went. Right. And the parking lot was full of cars, and everybody was getting loaded inside. It's well, like, we really have this weird sort of double standard about it, right? I mean, like we say nobody does it, but you know, the but bars have huge parking lots, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And we know that there. Well, are that's what we drivers. before you got in the car. I, I said to Andrew, I said I don't want to get too political, or you know, I know Andrew's against. You know, I'm against big government. I'm against nanny type government. But I do believe it's like it would be a great system. Listen, if you if you go drunk driving in New York, you're just an ass. You know, because it's like the one place where you don't have to be a drunk driver <laughs> in, <laughs> in New York City. In New York City, because you yeah. could just jump on the trains. You you know, you really. Yeah, but Lindsay Lohan doing cocaine on her dashboard on Sunset Boulevard 
First of all, she should have known family Again, exists. euthanized. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, another reason why she should be put to sleep. But, right, but I mean, um, you know, I mean, if you're that rich and you can't get a driver. But, right. I mean, what, what's but, the problem? But he, again, that's where the insanity of addiction and alcoholism is. And poor is, judgment. And poor judgment, right. which is always t- together with, al- you know, to alcoholism. I mean, y- you don't see the best judgers when they're drunk. But we and, were, and everybody that drinks believes that they they can drive. Right. Like, they you know, well, you can have three, four drinks and think you're fine. Right. And it's also like, oh, God, I don't want to have to get my car in the morning. You know, right. I'd rather die. I'd rather die in my car tonight or kill somebody than have to take a cab to get my car in the morning. You know, that's the crazy. That's, you know, but again, when you're drunk, you're not thinking rationally. There's no, you know, I mean, how many things are passed around when you are you know, in an altered state. But I, I think when you're a celebrity, though, you're living in a world of people surrounding you saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Absolutely. So, I mean, after about a year of that, you just start thinking yeah. that, you know, I can do anything. Right. Because you're in your own world. Sure. And that's why that's why you have these hot uh, male actors that get caught with a hooker, you know, <laughs> you know, like on Sunset Boulevard, because they, they can get anything they want. So they it becomes a turn on for them to, to get something skanky. So we now know mm-hmm. that Eric thinks that Eddie Murphy's hot. <laughs> or, or you Grant. Or you Grant. I, mean, does I thought you were talking about you Grant, by the way. Or you Grant, yeah, well. <laughs> but, but again, it's like, but just you, so you know. I, the, the discussion was, I, I and I said, when you go into a bar in many of these places, you're right. We're, we're not a trans, we're not a trains city. We don't have trains in California. Really, you know, the public transportation stinks. I'm sure where Ryan Dunn in Pennsylvania, it's not exactly the easiest to get from your house to the bar so i said whenever you walk into a bar you should have forty dollars and your keys you put it in an envelope when you go in you stick it in when you're about to leave the bar the bouncer you know has to give you a breathalyzer test if you pass you get your keys if you fail the 40 bucks to get to oh you, get God. to your car ride home yeah it's but just, bars are a business let's be honest i mean they're not going to do things like that why not it wouldn't deter many people i don't think that would deter that many people uh, you know, they said the same thing about if you cut smoking out of bars, uh, it, you know, people are going to stop going to bars. It hasn't happened. Yeah. It's just because people yeah. are w- more willing to go out and drink and then worry about, you know, smoking outside the bar in the five degree weather. So at this point, you know, if you had to have, you know, it's better to put precautions on something. There's a lot of clubs that open up in New York, though. It took away from the bar business. Um, I mean... Uh, not tremendous not as much as they thought yeah they, I, I just think legally I don't think that owners of businesses should be responsible for people's drinking you know mm-hmm. you hear about these restaurants that lose their liquor license or they they get uh, fined heavily or even right. put and in we're jail all paying for, for that with the extra insurance that they're having to pay you know with those liability insurance for bars and restaurants yeah and it's like if so. somebody comes in and I can't tell that they're wasted but I, I serve them alcohol anyway all of a sudden now I'm legally required to be responsible for their safety I just think that's right wrong. but but again if you were a bouncer and you set up one person's way hey, I'm creating jobs here the Republicans listening to this network should love this we're creating an extra job where this is the worst idea you've ever, you've ever had. <laughs> it might be one of the worst ideas I've ever had. I'm just trying. I don't, I don't I, I'm just trying. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to figure out ways that people, you know, could save their lives and not get in their car drunk. Right. Because it is, you know, forget about you. You know, that's the problem. Whenever people get in the car driving drunk, they're only like, Whoa, good. you know, they're only thinking about the consequence of themselves, not thinking about the accidents that they might be causing on the highway, killing other people. I think it's just another grisly reminder of the fact that a lot of people don't heal from the illness of alcoholism. A lot of people die from it. And I think that when you're involved in recovery, you become you become kind of wrapped up in getting through your life sober. And it's easy to forget that it kills people. I was one of the biggest people. drunk drivers. I, I, you know, so that's it, it, this is a hard thing for me to talk about. A lot of topics on this show for Andrew and I, for our guests, is because when we when you do get sober, it's you have to look at stuff and go, well, I did that. But it doesn't make it all right because I did it, mm-hmm. you know. And it's a very. Did you get a DWI or DUI? No, I almost did. Almost. I came did. as cl- I came as close. I was in Florida in West Palm Beach. Right. I get pulled over by this cop. <laughs> he pulls me out of the car. He's a police officer. <laughs> police officer yeah. frisks me. <laughs> does this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I get pulled over, and I, I am I am as drunk as you could possibly be. Right. And uh, and all of a sudden, you know, he's fr- he's looking through my cigarettes. I hear. He gets a call 
and it's like this mm-hmm. code blue or code red, some crazy call where he's got to go. Right. And he goes, kid, he goes, I know you're going to that bar across the street. He goes, you live three blocks away. It would be my best advice to you <laughs> to go home and not go to that bar. So I said, oh, my God, thank you, officer. And he lets me go. Wow. How long ago was that? It was about 15 years ago. Yeah, that's back when I was in my 20s. A cop could pull you over and they knew you were drunk. They'd just say, hey, just go home. Yeah, but guess where I went? I went to the bar, (laughs) you know, and I go to the bar and I order a beer. My hand was shaking so severely that I decided I was like, "Okay, let me just go right home. But (laughs) but again, and, you know. So I'm sorry to laugh, but just the visual. But yeah. I think yeah, your so, hand shaking. Yeah, my you having to go home <laughs> in my Chrysler <laughs> Baron 1984, and um, but I do think that most people don't, you know, with the drunk driving, they're not thinking about the effects that they're having on other people. You know, my father used to say I wanted the car when I was drinking, and he said, "I'm not giving you a weapon. You know, I will not give you a weapon that you could, that you could, yeah." So I, I hear you. And uh, we're in the studio tonight with uh, our lovely and handsome uh, fine comedian, uh, Kevin Hahn. <laughs> Eric Hahn. Our, Eric Hahn. Uh, Eric. Uh, what did I say? <laughs> Eric. You said Kevin. I said Kevin Hahn. Yeah. <laughs> it's Eric Hahn. Eric Hahn. Yeah. And our uh, illustrious uh, host, Andrew Spanswick, who keeps on making signs to me. And we are going to take a break. We're we'll be back break. in a second. And we have uh, Dr. Torrington here with us tonight as well, who will be joining us and, after the break. And is this the music you this chose? This is the mo- music I chose because wow. some people are having a bad day. Oh, I want you to, we're going to have to talk about staffing here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening right, to Clean Radio. Radio. We'll be back in a second. We'll be right back. <laughs> Passion's gone. AM 830. Oh, there's Judah with the Judah dance. <laughs> There's this great clip on our website, uh, cleancenter.com. Actually, cleanradio.com. Clean with a K. Dot com. I have to say. Dot com. Clom. Yes. Dot com. With the Judah dance. Yes. I encourage everyone to go see it. It's our viral. We're trying to make this one viral. It's a great dance. I think we got 100 hits so far. It's like 104. 104. I track it. Yeah. Every minute. It's, it's, it's <laughs> you're, you're the 104th hit. Yes. So it's just Judah watching. And supposedly it's a lot of fun to, to watch while you're drunk. <laughs> yeah, not good for our show, but, you know, anyway. So we got Eric Hahn here t- tonight. Howdy. And we have Dr. Torrington. How's Welcome. it going? Good. Thanks for having Welcome me. Welcome to uh, Clean Radio. It's your first appearance here. I'm very glad. Very glad to be here. Well, very good. And and you got us on the 8 o'clock night. When yeah. We, when we moved for, to 8 o'clock. On our first opening 8 o'clock show. 10 o'clock. Hooray! Hooray! <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Trunkton, give us a little background on yourself. Be really uh, I'm a family medicine doctor with a specialty in addiction medicine. medicine. I'm also a clinical research physician mm-hmm. and uh, practice in every area of addiction medicine from methadone clinics to intensive outpatient programs to residential treatment centers to inpatient detox. I worked as a hospitalist, and now my focus is pretty much on longitudinal disease management of addiction, which means taking care of people over time right. as opposed to just in discrete intervals and I also do clinical research about 20% time at UCLA and I also have a free clinic that I run which is another 20% of my time do you have a hobby <laughs> <laughs> basketball surfing Bas- basketball, my kids and the free clinic that's great. pinball and the free clinic right? yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool that you do the that's free great. clinic that's great it's amazing amount of stuff you're doing it's I just I got really agitated about the fact that there's so many people who need help, especially with the biologic part of treatment, mm-hmm. and it's so hard to get. Um, you know, with the large number of people with no insurance and the difficulty of getting care from physicians, I just felt like it was the natural thing to do. Uh, there's an organization called Common Ground Westside, which is like a HIV prevention and outreach center, and they for years have had a needle exchange, pretty much the only one on the west side of LA. Mm -hmm. And then they started offering HIV and hep C testing and they were like, would you support us in that and write the orders for the tests? I'm like, of course. And then there was this idea to start a naloxone overdose prevention project, which means Mm -hmm. basically at the needle exchange, you train people to use Narcan, opiate antagonists, to save each other's lives when they overdose. So for our listeners, it's basically a shot that you give someone they overdose and it instantly takes them out of the overdose. That's right. It reverses the It's like Russian roulette for junkies. Wow. Reverse <laughs> Russian, Russian roulette. Russian roulette. <laughs> it's more like you're dead and now you're alive. Right. Okay. You overdose, you overdose yeah. on heroin and you block the receptors. You stop the action of the heroin. You wake up sick and it's annoying, right. but it's better than being dead. 
And so I was like, oh, I want, I'm in, you know, so I, I helped them with that. And then I was like, it's great to have all this harm reduction, but what about treatment? Right. Right. So for our listeners, what is harm reduction? Because we've spoken about that on other shows, but there seems to be, you know, a lot of confusion out there as to what's harm reduction versus treatment versus criminalization. That's a really good question. I'm sure that there's a textbook de de uh, definition that someone other than I could look up. But my, when I think about harm reduction, I think of any technique that you can employ to reduce morbidity or reduce damage to the person who's suffering. And so that means that I don't have a particular definition of what recovery is. I don't say everybody has to make it to, uh, you know, living great, not taking any medication, being wonderful to every person that they meet, never lying, and wearing a cape. Because well, that you would know, be a saint. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's <laughs> yeah. like that doesn't, to me, like, I, or I me. It's, right. just, <laughs> it's just whatever, you know, what, it, what recovery is, is what it is for that individual. And if some people's idea of harm reduction is like people smoking pot instead of drinking alcohol. Right. Well, I mean, you're basically saying I'm willing to, you know, harm reduction is whatever gets you to the place where you could get better. Whatever avoids damage to you. Right. Whatever can, or, or death. Right. So it's like right. people are going to use drugs intravenously. Give them clean needles so they don't get HIV and Hep C. No, I really don't want people using drugs intravenously, but I really don't want them to get HIV and Hep C. And if that's preventable, I'd like to prevent that. Well, that's obviously a very, you know. That, could, that, that, this, that conversation could bring out a lot of opposing views on the other well, side. I, what I think is interesting is that, uh, you know, there's been several different camps. There's, you know, strict prohibitionists, sort of like, uh, you know, you've got to, if you're going to stop drinking, you've got to stop drinking completely, that there's no way to moderate your drinking. Then there's people that believe that there are ways to moderate drinking. You know, and that's a whole other issue. Then there's harm they're reduction. Called and they're called alcoholics. <laughs> right. And then there's people that say, oh, you know, uh, that we can't necessarily dictate behavior. There's a lot of people that are going to use anyway. Let's at least meet patients or clients or, or alcoholics or drug addicts where they are and try and engage them and join with them and, you know, reduce these externalities, these extra problems that occur due to their addiction um, and try and reduce you know, uh, hep C or drunk driving. We were talking about earlier, you know, like uh, cab rides home for people. That's another form of harm reduction, right? So, yeah, right. Absolutely. So, so you yeah, know, that's uh, so do we become an intelligent society that actually says, okay, this is a problem and we're not going to cure it. There's no way to get rid of it. So do we provide all these ways to reduce the harm of sort of like a vaccine? So well, like an intellectual no, vaccine, vaccine would stop it, though, right? This, these are things that just minimize the externalities or extra symptoms that occur because of, of, of the actual disease of ad addiction or abuse of drugs or alcohol. I mean, there's a huge difference between use and dependence, and there's a difference between use, abuse, and dependence. Right. And so, it's not about like, you know, alcohol being the problem. It's the use of alcohol to the point that it destroys your entire life. That's the main issue, right? So, like, I'm not out there in bars telling people, don't drink, right? right? But when people are continuing to use, to self-administer drug or alcohol against their will, to their detriment, to me, that's where the battle is. That okay. complete loss of control. Which is addiction and alcoholism. Right. Absolutely. And right. that's, you know, to me, that's, that's where the fight so, is. Right. right. So, you're basically saying, I'm willing, which I agree with, you know, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to keep you alive until you could get help. Or I'm willing to meet you where you are. And, right. if, and if you're somebody who says, listen, I have no interest in stopping using, right. no problem. I, you know what? I'm not here to tell you what right. your goals are. But if you are going to keep using, I much prefer you not to get HIV and Hep C because I'm going to pay for that anyway down right. the road. And so let's just avoid that because that's bad. You know, in the 12 steps, there's two camps. Too. I mean, there's more than two camps. But to just, you know, there's the people that, oh, my, fr my sponsor or my friend started drinking again. No more connection. Or the people that will say to them, listen, I love you. Call me whenever you want. Let's talk. We could still hang out. You know, and I'm not going to give up on you or whatever it is. And if you decide one day you want to get sober, maybe you're not an alcoholic. Whatever it is, we're still there. And yeah, I think in the therapeutic community, it's, it's, it's much more about joining with a client. You know, with family and friends, it can be much more difficult because there's so much anger and resentment towards the addict. You know, they've been, there's been so much disappointment sometimes, so many failures of attempts to get the family member sober, and they're just like, I'm sick of it. And then you have this tough love aspect, which I actually don't agree with. I right? don't agree people, with it either. A lot of people do sort of adhere to where you 
I believe tough in. love is like electroshock therapy. I mean, to me, it's it's. It you mean was, in, in it being? It was a concept, but it's it's. Well, ECT it's, actually is now very well. Oh really? Yeah, it definitely. Can, it can make a difference. Yeah, ECT has actually come a long way. They've improved the treatment. What about lobotomies? Are they still? No, lobotomies are better. Lobotomy. Is, is that right. still? Yeah, stick with lobotomy. But I think, but I think when you talk, I mean, and I think this is something we all have to be really careful of. Whenever you generalize, you're going to be wrong. Right. And the reality is, if there's one thing I've learned in this work, is that it's one person at a time one individualized solution at a time because there isn't one answer and there isn't one way to solve this problem it's always going to have to be a specific situation for people so maybe tough love isn't like in general the right answer but if people don't have contingencies like you know if you do this then that will happen if every time they do this and that never happens then they have no motivation to stop doing but that's this. a consequence I, I i think when people hear tough love it come a lot of the time it, or the stigma to tough love is that it's like oh, i never want to see you again you know it's like you're my son get out of here you know these are the consequences and you know just to use my father as an example my father used to say as long as my son's alive i i, I won't stop trying to help him that didn't mean he was going to continually give me money or give me access to a car now and he does that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he sort of does now that you're but, sober now right. he does that. but then it was like as, but, but if my son ever needs treatment then I will def I will gladly get him into a place where he could get help. Right. So that so does that mean does that, that that's not tough love? In your I don't life? consider that. I I consider, uh, I used to know a therapist in New York that used to call that love tough. You know, and he used to switch the words I around. Like that. Where you know, idea, yeah. and 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 it, it was like I heard this guy, this great twelve step speaker named Scott Redmond share, share this one time. He goes, you know, we treat people with the anesthetic of love and the the the, the anesthetic of the scalpel of love and the anesthetic of pain, or the anesthetic of love and the scalpel of pain. It's basically like I'm, you know, I'm going to give you the right, the, I'm going to give you the story, but I'm going to love you when I give it, give when I tell you the story. You know, and I think a lot of people don't know how to do those two things at the same time. Say, I, you need help. I'm going to bring you through this. And, you know, I don't think... It, 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 I, I hear what you're saying. And I guess part of what I would say is that, like, you know, to me, that's tough love. Because it's tough to not give you money when you call crying. Right. It's tough to take away your car when you know that you're not going to be able to get to work and it's going to really make your life really difficult. But it's love to stay in there and hang in with there with the loved one no matter what. But it takes that toughness to hold them accountable and to make sure that the person who's working the hardest is the patient. Right, but I don't think people get that point. I'm saying when people are being told these things, I think they're getting the, 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 the idea in their head of cutting them off, that they're cut off. I don't believe that people are like, well, they're cut off, but unless they need help. Or well, you know, I think a mistake I made when I was younger and I started and as brash. a therapist. No, when I started as a therapist is that I would assume that all the clients and the, the patients and the family members knew sort of everything that I did. And so I would sort of instruct them like they knew already a lot of stuff and I didn't realize that people are very naive about a lot of these topics right and they don't really know it all and and they haven't lived through it all eight nine times you know or had a hundred clients that have been similar and so it becomes very easy um, as a therapist to sort of you know join too quickly and push your ideas too quickly you have to actually educate and guide people through this process and yet at the same point we're dealing with an illness that when we generally get the client they're in a point of crisis they've overdosed they've had a DWI um, been to jail you know, they've been to jail yeah. they've had some serious health consequence secondary to the abuse of alcohol or drugs so there's this you know urgent need to intervene and yet there's still this longitudinal amount of work that needs to be done. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I feel like that it, what I learned in addiction medicine in the last decade is that we spend so much of our energy after the acute situation. They've been shot. We're getting the bullet out. We're healing up the wound. We're helping them. And that's like all this acute care. It's not really the answer. It doesn't. Right. Addiction is a lot more like type 2 diabetes than a gunshot wound. And what we do is we get them all healed up from the bullet wound and say, okay, go, go be sober. Right. But it's not really, it's disease management. Well, it's so, like I always said with Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan, I love, she was right. Just say no. But then what? <laughs> what did that do? It was like, and then what? <laughs> you know, so the concept was great. Just say no. 
And what are they supposed to do? You know, Gandhi had that famous line, if you're going to take something away from somebody, you have to give them something of equal or greater importance. So if you're saying to an 18-year-old kid, you know, I quoted Gandhi there. And if you're... if you're, it's pretty it, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. From Nancy Reagan and, to Gandhi. Uh, from Nancy Reagan to Gandhi. <laughs> and Gandhi. And, uh, awesome. But, if, you know, we Actually, say... Actually, they were the same person. Nobody knows <laughs> that. But. but it's something... It's, it's, <laughs> they could have been. Okay. It's, it's something we talk... It, 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 they both were But aggressive. it's something we talk about on the show a lot is, you know, after the drink. What do you do after you're sober? And I think that's one of the things that's, that's not spoken about a lot is the life afterwards. Yeah. And, you know, like you were saying about longevity and care that's part of it is like when i was 18 years old in rehab we used to have this drug counselor that took us to like rem and radiohead shows Sweet. in israel and i remember thinking there i remember well, this is too much information for my mind to comprehend no radio had opened for rem in israel radio had opened for rem in israel and and it was it was when they came out with creep it was great it's when they came out with creep. and i remember th- and our, he re- he said to me he goes you might hate sobriety he goes but there's one thing you'll never be able to tell me and i said why he goes that it's not fun right. and he was right i oh, i was never able because you know you always hear people say they get sober and they go oh it's gonna be so boring i'm gonna have no fun and he showed us how to have fun he showed us how to have life and i think you know one of the things we try to come across on the show is you know we have a comedian in tonight we have you know people with careers going on that are sober is that there is life after amen all right well, yeah. we're gonna go out to a quick break uh, it's clean radio. Oh, th- you finally picked a good song. Yes, I did. Right? No, it's Vanilla Ice. Um, <laughs> the number it's here David is David Bowie. <laughs> I know. The number here is 877 8830 That's 877 We'll be back in a couple. Okay. Help overcoming addictive disorders? Call us now at 8778 830 830 or log on to clean with a K, cleanradio.com. Clean Radio on Angels Radio AMA 30 is presented by Clean Residential Treatment Center, a dynamic and professional addiction treatment facility. Now it's back to Andrew and Judah. Welcome back to Clean Radio for the Block Boy. Yeah. Oh, it's the Judah dance. And that was for the block boy, not for the black boy. <laughs> um, just, just, I'll give you a shovel. You just keep digging a hole. Scarface, the fix. <laughs> anyway, welcome back, listeners, uh, to Clean Radio, where we talk about addiction and recovery. Today we have Eric Hahn in the studio, uh, accomplished comedian. Lovely. Thank you. Talented. You got Thank any shows coming me. up soon, Eric? Uh, I do have a couple shows. I have a show uh, Tuesday night at M Bar at the corner of Fountain and Vine. Oh, exactly. Um, yeah, what else? I have my open mic starting Wednesday night in West Hollywood at the Grand House Coffee Shop oh. on Havenhurst. We're very excited about that. Wow, that, you're going to be running that show? Yeah, Amy's going up for me. Oh, that's my Amy's wife. Andrew's that's wife. my wife, yes. Amy Dresner. Yes. Love her. Yeah, she's. Uh, yeah, I have to say I love her too. Not for comedy, but for I her. love her. I just have to say it like that. <laughs> no, I was going to ask you to say it. Love her. <laughs> and then we also have Dr. Torrington. Welcome, Dr. Torrington. Welcome back. Hello. Hey. So here we are. So Eric, you're sober. Yes, 18 years. 18 wow. years. Congratulations. Life. I know. Amazing, huh? I did, I right. never. I don't know. I it's, thought I thought I, you were. I thought you were 18. <laughs> it's the moisturizer. When you get, <laughs> when, when you, did you get sober when you were nine? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> 25 actually, and 25, I. 25. That's young. I, but I didn't think so at the time. I really, really felt like I waited to the very last minute to get sober, and then. Mm. I was just so lucky. There was just so many uh, blessings that were thrown in my lap when I first got sober. It was, it was an incredible year. It was like uh, so my first year was just an amazing. Was year. it alcohol, drugs, everything? It was alcohol, all alcohol, all alcohol. Yeah, hey, that makes the wow. two of us. We're like dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> Everybody we see now is we're a dinosaur. Yeah, yeah. Right? it's old school. Yeah, it's old school. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Torrington, that's, that's OG, so boring. Huh? That's so easy OG. to treat. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the hardest, actually. You think just straight alcohol is hardest, dude? I don't. I'm. Last time I went in the grocery store, nobody was trying to sell crack there. That's true. And when you go into somebody's house, they don't offer you crack. When you sit down at a restaurant, they don't offer you. Or crack. go to a baseball game, they're not bringing down like a rack of joints. That's right. You know, or a rack of ecstasy, going three dollar ecstasy, three dollar ecstasy. I mean, you know how hard it was my first baseball game getting sober. Right. I mean, all like beer, all the beer and the smell and everything everybody drunk next to me and it was like oh. mm. see I never had to cope with that and I'm so glad once again like, it was a blessing for me because you I, don't like baseball because <laughs> <laughs> you don't like sports <laughs> you didn't go to the Dodgers <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> right 
I would like sports if they hugged more. They, I oh. think there needs to be more hugs. It's called wrestling. It's called wrestling. Yeah, right. it's called or boxing MMA. these days. <laughs> <laughs> we got a sport for you. Don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> I'll give you a little tough time. You, <laughs> you're you're going to have a tough time? Go to an MMA show. <laughs> Patrick will get you tickets. Yeah. He films them. So there nice. you go. That, yeah. anyway. So anyway, so you were drinking a lot. I was drinking a lot. I started drinking when I was 12 years old, and uh, mm-hmm. I knew my drinking was a lot different from everybody else. It was so important to me. I you just grew up in the Midwest? Grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Ohio, right. you know, the snow belt, the corn belt. See, I, belt. when it's snowing, what else can you do but drink? I, mean, I know. That's, 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 that's what you do in Ohio. You and kept t- tip cows. And tip cows. But, you know, I tell people, when I was 12 years old, I could buy alcohol very easily. Really? Oh, yeah. It, just go it, to the it, next it changed. Was, it changed. Oh, yeah, it used had, to be a lot easier. I mean, you know, when you could just sit on the bar stool, they'd serve you. Now well, it's, see, I lived in New Orleans, and they said if you were old enough to reach the bar, you were old yeah. enough to buy a drink. Now it's the total reverse. Yeah. It's easier for kids and to young people to get drugs, drugs yeah. than it is, you know, rob somebody a parent's medicine cabinet than it is to go because of, you know. Get stuff off the Internet. Right. Well, yeah, I would just walk into stores and act like I know what I was doing and just be really confident. I was taller than all my friends, so I was yeah. always the one that bought the booze. And you were bald. I was bald. <laughs> <laughs> I was bald. I had crow's feet when I was <laughs> nine. <laughs> <laughs> He, he just shaved his head in the middle. Of the, yeah. <laughs> the number here, by the way, is 877-8830-830. That's 877-8830-830. You could also listen to us on cleanradio.com. Yeah. So, Eric, so how did you get sober? You decided one day... I knew for a long time. I knew from the time I was 16 until I got sober at 25 that I had a problem with alcohol. Were you like binge drinking or not binge drinking? Just I mean, I drank as much as my lifestyle could allow me to. You know, when I was in high school, I was very involved in a lot of activities and a lot of, you know, music things and whatnot. So I I didn't drink, of course, much then. But then when when I graduated high school, then is when I started the daily drinking, and I Mm -hmm. I would drink like 12, 14 beers a night. What about in the morning? Did you start drinking in the morning? Or I no? never drank in the morning. I wasn't a big. Oh, yeah. uh, well, when did you wake up? Yeah, when did you wake up? <laughs> at about four in the afternoon. Right, because so. people always Judy say says, that. I never drank in the morning. I never drank in the morning. But, I, the morning, but I woke two. up at five in the <laughs> afternoon and I started drinking. So that was my morning. Oh. I would still wake up in the morning. I'm I'm kind of a morning guy. So even huh. when in my drinking days, I would still wake up at like you know nine. That must have been yeah. hell. It was awful. But I was young. I was young. You know, you drink all night. <clears> you you right. get an hour of sleep and then you wake up and you just do it again. You but know? That's the problem. I'm very similar. I think when you when you meet the just people that drank, we knew. We always knew that we were an alcoholic. Oh, because, you know, it's like when you're using drugs or you're smoking pot or, you're, you know, the beginning stuff of the drug addiction, everybody around you is doing it. And you could sort of gauge yourself. I mean... But when you're drinking and you're an alcoholic, you know you're... you're yeah, but also people that are alcoholics tend to surround themselves with people that drink all the time, right? They're the only people that can call people up at 3 in the morning and have a friend come over that drinks. Right? Well, you know, I, I, I just... I always envied these people that had all this denial because yeah. I thought, you know, I could use yeah. some denial because I, it was so evident to me that, that right. alcohol really ruled me and, and really drove my bus for Did a you try time. and stop? Like, or did you... Like, I never... What? tried controlled drinking right. I never tried any other method I, I I knew I wanted to I knew I had to go into treatment so mm. I, I I chose to leave Ohio and I went to Boston to a, a, a facility there and it was an amazing amazing uh, rehab uh, and it was actually for people that had multiple disabilities as a result of their drinking and their drug taking so I was the only one in the program during that time that didn't have any physical ailments from drinking you know, I was 25. Right. So I had like about 20 people on the floor with me that, that were in wheelchairs and walkers. And, wow, that's a wake-up call. Yeah, big time. Right. So yeah. he, the guy that uh, let me in on that program, he did a smart thing because it really showed me, you know, how much damage uh, alcohol can do. Talk alcohol about scared does. straight. Yeah, I'm right. Telling you. <laughs> Well, so well, well, right. You're probably <laughs> speaking, <laughs> right. <laughs> also, if you can stop young enough, you can stop before your brain is really severely damaged. And even though you may have already been drinking abnormally from a very, very early age, um, stopping young is a great thing because it leaves your braking system intact. 
I generally think about each person as being born with sort of a different kind of genetic braking tone. Some people are born with big, burly truck brakes, you know, and their brakes last a long time. And some people are born with small little car brakes and their brakes don't last nearly as long. And it's really important that you retain that ability to stop when, you know, the front part of your brain tells you to stop. And, and so quitting when you're young is a great advantage. Except it's, when you get here when you're young, you absolutely hate it. You know, at least I did. I used to be so jealous when I got when I got sober. I was 22 when I got sober, and I used to see these people like a human when they were 40, and all I could think about was, wow, you had an extra 18 years out there. <laughs> wow. That's all I could think about. And then I realized one day, because you know, when, when I got sober young, people would always say, you're so lucky you got this while you're young. And I would look at them and go, you are so lucky you got this while you're old. And then I realized no matter what age you get sober at, you were miserable in the beginning. You know, that you, when you come into a, a, to a 12-step program or a rehab, you should be miserable. You know? I think a lot of people are relieved. You know, well, I think for a lot of people, addiction is painful. Well, I think for me, when you I know? came in here, I was, I mean, I probably have a different experience than you did. But when I first came in, I was like, oh, my God, I got to do this for the rest of my life. Well, for me, the surrender came the day. Uh, it was very dramatic for me. I can remember uh, vividly walking into that rehab with a suitcase, and I just thought, wow, this is this is just it. This is the bottom. I've hit bottom, you know. Mm. Have you and ever relapsed? I've never relapsed. And that's I've, incredible. So that's amazing. Yeah. I, yeah. Right? yeah. Pray! <laughs> I never, you know, it's funny because I don't have a physical compulsion to drink. I, mm. I, that was lifted from me. I know God lifted that from me very mm. early because had I had to grapple with that, I probably would have relapsed because I am all about physical things. Like mm. cigarettes is another thing. Like cigarettes took me forever to quit smoking because I, I, I just physically had to have them. But alcohol, I, I just... You know, it's funny because people have now become aware since it's plainly obvious, but it, that cigarettes are bad for you. But in and you're talking about <laughs> alcohol, you know, uh, that you know the earlier you stop, the more likely you are not to have brain damage. And it's amazing how many people really don't think alcohol is bad for you. Yeah, well, I mean, that's because in, in moderate quantities, it can be helpful. So that's the real dichotomy of alcohol. Very moderate. Let's just yeah, like moderate. One, one drink a day. <laughs> one drink a day. One right. drink of red wine a day. I mean, they, there's another study that came out recently just confirming that. And so that be, becomes this incredible du double-edged sword. Um, and Which makes it harder, too. Of course. Because it's a socially acceptable thing. You know how many people would say to you, come on, you could just well, I remember when they put the cancer label on alcohol, and I was like, what? I mean, right. like, you know, but like if you I'm were a crack, if you were a crackhead and like you got sober, nobody ever is going to go to you. Come on, just you could do a rock. You can smoke a little. Yeah, crack. you can just on. do a rock every once in a while, can't you? A lot of people thought cocaine yeah. was no big deal when it came out. You know. Like, oh, you know, it was, so. and you know, the story I guess was that like some doctors at Harvard were partying with cocaine, and they noticed right. that one of their buddies had a stroke, <laughs> and they took him to the ER, and then they started doing some research, and they're like, wow, potent vasoconstrictor at the smallest blood vessels. Right. Mm, right. Small <laughs> blood vessels in the brain and the heart that seems like a bad idea which is amazing too though the, the myth there's a like a myth in the 80s was that len bias you know the you know the former first round pick of first pick of the draft by the boston celtics who died with a day the first time he did the second pick. they say it was the first time but i mean supposedly he had a lot of scar tissue on his or am i thinking of reggie lewis but nonetheless that really it was brought, bias yeah. it was Lynn bias that mm -hmm. i think reggie lewis also died with, from mm -hmm. scar tissue on his uh you see a lot of heart. cardiac arrest though, right. in sports from related to amphetamines not just and cocaine right but i think right. that also brought into i remember that was when you started hearing about how bad it took this athlete to die on the night of his draft that people say right. well maybe coke is an issue yeah. right but but in the, uh, back in the day, you know, cocaine was commonly found in doctors' offices. It was the treatment of choice for nosebleed. I mean, it just wasn't really considered to be this yeah. like How really, is that? really yeah, that is oh, right. potent vasoconstrictor. Right. You know, yeah. What well, used to be in anesthetic? It well, well, wasn't it in a surgery, surgery, It wasn't like. Wasn't it in Coke? Yeah, but it was in the 1850s. Yeah, well, that's... You know. And Dr. Pepper was created to help your stomach. <laughs> How old are you? Back when Nancy Reagan was a <laughs> <laughs> Back when Nancy Reagan was a young girl. Uh. <laughs> she was like, just say yo. So <laughs> <I> might, <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Sorry. Right? So comedians always got to take us there, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it's interesting to talk about smoking, because smoking kills more people than all the other addictions combined. Right. It's insidious. Number one. I, smoking, and because of the fact that people st still think of smoking as harmless because you can do it 
while you're driving. You can do it at work. You can do it. But that's what makes it so insidious that it incorporates into your life. And then the next thing you know, you have 25, 30 years of smoking behind you and you're, you're dying from a smoke related illness. It's true, but we're changing though. I mean, culturally, I mean, I can remember smoking on the airplane, smoking, you know, in the library. Uh, they, I mean, even, you know, basketball coaches used to smoke on the sideline during games. And what about chewing the, 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 the chewing tobacco? Yeah. They're trying to get rid of that. Yeah. They're even getting rid of the, I mean, because the, you know, we, were t- we started the show with, uh, you know, talking about drunk driving and the guy from Jackass, Ryan Dunn, you know, died he last week. In car accident. But, you know, every time we walk into the so stadium, sad. we see a, pi- a picture of that picture of the angels that was killed last year by the drunk driver. And um, I forgot where I was going with this point, but. Uh, That's why you, we keep you here on the radio. Th- that is why you keep me here <laughs> on the radio. But, of uh, no, so, you know, they've cut out the, the nicotine. They've tried, oh, it was banning the, after the clubhouse, they banned uh, during the World Series now, they banned champagne in a lot of clubhouses. You know, they're, huh. they're, they're trying to, you know, take away drugs and alcohol. Especially when the Yankees won the World Series and they had strawberry and yeah, right. on the team. <laughs> they didn't allow any alcohol in the, uh, so the people are realizing and trying to come to say, you know, maybe this, every lot, you know, everything all right isn't always all right. But, I mean, all addiction, right? It's biologic, it's psychological, it's social, it's spiritual, and it's nutritional. And the way our society has changed, changed, our cultural folkways and mores are adapting to this information, and it takes time. And that's why, you know, like the demographics are up, cancer deaths are up, because all the women who started smoking in the 50s and 60s, they're getting older now, and they're reaping what they sowed. Hopefully, you know, like, I mean, I meet patients all the time now, sometimes heroin users, and they don't smoke cigarettes. So it's like interesting, like that, that never happened before. You mm-hmm. know, like, so I think that people, maybe young people are getting the picture like, you know, you can smoke in fewer and fewer places, can't smoke in bars, all that. It's, those changes will help over time. You know what I'm also noticing a lot lately as I walked through Venice Beach yesterday is women in their 30s with tattoos all over their bodies walking, having baby carriages. Now, to the young people out there, this what must is stop. This, what is well, this? I, I this don't know. I, I, I just, t- it's, it was just something. <laughs> no, no, as we've changed. As, 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 so, yeah, it, it, the, that's the most tangential statement purple. yet <laughs> yes, this on is, Clean Radio. This was, it, it, it was, I was walking. I was walking. Note that on the time stamp I, for I, another Judaism. Yes, I was. <laughs> but I just started noticing women in their 30s having these tattoos all over their bodies. You didn't see this 10 years ago. Now I sound like a 90-year-old man. Right? Well, is but, what are you uh, about? Like, we, we've changed this as a society is what i was on really, venice beach really it's it's, it's all, always it, been tattoos on venice okay, beach okay but uh, you, you wouldn't see it basically with 30 year old women walking baby carriages having you know their whole back tattooed okay that's well, just a I yes. just think I just think it's fashion. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I wasn't complaining. You were. Uh, yes, I am. You're Jewish and you don't believe in tattoos. Let's yeah, be honest. It's, it's, there you go with your anti-Semitic. Yeah, I'm just saying. Oh, that's right. that's <laughs> not anti-Semitic. Hey, I heard that's not true. Actually, somebody. Uh, uh, a they noted source said that that's actually they've actually been changing the policy about being buried in a Jewish. Cemetery. Well, the two big myths about Judaism are the one, the sheet. You know, anytime, any, anybody, time anybody ever walks up to me and goes, I have a question for you. I'm like, no, we don't have sex for a sheet. Right. Um, and the second one is. <laughs> what? I never heard of yeah, that. Yeah, the Orthodox Jews were. It was a, a whole story. Curb Your Enthusiasm episode. And the second one is the burial about suicide is one where, you, you're, you know, if you commit suicide, that you will not, you, they don't really allow you in a Jewish burial site. But the thing with the tattoo is, obviously that can't be true, Is how because how many Jews from 60 years ago were forced to have a tattoo on them, so. Right. Yes. So it was just a Jewish mother trying to scare her Exactly, it's like if you roll your eyes up, they could stay up there. <laughs> <laughs> they might, yeah. they might. Yeah. Or if the you doctor p- says they might. Or if you pick your nose, your, you know, your nostrils get bigger. I mean, these were things, you know. The that old, will happen, stretching. Yeah, look at me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they're huge. I used, just, I used to trudge. I can't I stop looking that. at them now. Right? I used to trudge. I mean, that's body modification. You're against tattoos, but you're for nostril stretching. Oh, I'm totally <laughs> for tattoos. <laughs> in, 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 a, in a okay amount. In an okay amount. And what amount is that? It's That's it, just the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard. Okay. You are the Carl Pinkleton of clean ra- radio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know why I get that right now? Because right. I was watching an idiot abroad yesterday. Oh, you right? okay. And it's Pinkerton. Pinkerton. No, oh, Pinkerton. Yes. Get the okay. name right on the insult. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. If you're going to insult me, get it correctly. And
And, wow. Uh, okay. You're listening to Clean Radio. The number here is 877-8830-830. The right. number here is 877-8830. If you want to insult Judah, call, give us a call. Give me a call. It, it happens on a weekly here. basis. <laughs> Andrew's mother, who I'm going to meet this week, actually defends me. Last week, our guest, she calls me up. She goes, she goes to Andrew. I think he was a little hard on Judah. And yeah. he's actually a friend of mine. We had an FBI profiler yeah. in last week, which, by the way, if people want to see the show, then go to uh, clean cleanradio.com. Com clean with a K and um, and uh, watch the show from last week and the guy was just brutal yeah he was he, he was yeah he yeah. just took Judah apart yes he yeah. was profile and, he, and he's my friend and he's his friend right he was nice to everyone else and just and the, went after Judah the note to self is no more friends in the studio <laughs> wow did you guys have a falling out? No, 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 no. We have friends now on Facebook. <laughs> the, guy, the guy works with the FBI you just gotta yeah. stay friends with him no yeah, matter what you don't so. uh, <laughs> Yeah, he's he's a good guy. He just wait. So we're not yeah. friends. I don't know. I, I, I was, I was just like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, you could be one of my six hundred thirty-seven friends now. I'm in. What about that whole car ride from West LA? We're right? now friends. Does that mean nothing? Yeah, that we we broke car bread. <sighs> car bread. Once you hang out with a guy in a car for an hour and a half, you're friends. That's my. Uh, well, car ride, make out, one of the two. Oh, boy. <laughs> Whoa. Just kidding. I'm kidding. That was actually you and Andrew. I took, um, <laughs> I took it to a gay place. Hey, you I, know, I got to get guests. We actually did have a great conversation on the way here because we were talking about very topical stuff, you know, and we were and talking I'm about... And I'm very out. I'm a homosexual guy. This is true. <laughs> and who is who's who was who, teaching us all about social media? I teaching, love yes, who's teaching about. us all about <laughs> and, and apps and apps and that apps, they have the gay apps, the gay apps that we yes. didn't even know about. The gaps. Well, that's an addiction to some extent. Do you think it's a huge addiction? It's right? one that I've sexual I've compulsions probably dabble in. I mean, it's just it's, it's <laughs> probably dabble. Probably, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's denial. Yeah. <laughs> there's really no dabbling with sex addiction. Right, you're either in or you're out. <laughs> you know, there's no like you're not, you never meet a sexaholic that's like. I was a dabbler. A dab <laughs> what gets you into trouble with sex addiction is you had no ability not to dabble. I, right. No, I sampled from the buffet. I, yeah. took, I took just a little nibble right. of the uh, sexual Well, addiction. that's one of the things that comes up a lot. We talk about addiction being compulsive behavior, right? And it switches from one compulsion to another. So we see a lot of process addictions re uh, replacing addictions to chemical substances right you yeah and a lot that? of that has to do with the different parts of the brain if you think about the front part of your brain the new or neocortex where you make executive decisions like how to find the anaheim baseball stadium <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay so you're saying your frontal lobe is a little damaged well it's, 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 it's worked. i got here right i'm here so, get there, right? um, but it's really different from the back part of your brain with your brain stem and your cerebellum which controls your pancreas and your liver and your spleen you know i'm pretty smart i found my way to anaheim but i have no idea how to secrete the right amount of insulin to digest my dinner right so just i have no control over that part of my brain and in between those two parts of the brain is a constellation of brain structures called the limbic brain and the limbic brain is responsible to make sure every human breathes more frequently than they eat more frequently than they sleep more frequently than they have sex and that part of your brain the limbic brain is connected to the front and the back it can affect the way that you think and the way that you feel hmm. when you do these pleasurable activities the limbic brain pays you in dopamine the currency of reward okay and so that dopamine release is ultra motivating to you and so you get a penny in dopamine for a breath and a quarter for food and 50 cents for sleep and a dollar or two maybe for sex depending on how it goes down you're a rich right? man <laughs> it's it's in food stamps and so <laughs> <but still. laughs> you can team so. up at guard you never know <laughs> right? so but but the point is is that you know Alcohol pays five bucks a drink, cocaine pays 300 bucks, opiates pay 600, and meth pays a thousand. And that's part of what happens is the limbic brain gets overwhelmed by these dopamine rich experiences and starts to affect the way people think and the way they feel to get them to keep using. So one analogy I'll use for people a lot of times is I'll say, listen, your limbic brain can literally change your teleprompter. It can reorder the words. It can put new sentences in to get you to think stupid stuff to keep using. At the same time, it can affect the way you feel, giving you fevers, chills, sweats, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, runny nose, watery eyes, muscle pain, bone pain, joint pain, restlessness, agitation, insomnia, irritability, craving, depression, you name it. Wow. All in the attempt to get more dopamine, because when your limbic brain wants you to use, it really wants you to use. So when you're when a, when somebody who's truly addicted, that when they're hungry for their next fix, they're hungry for that 
you know, fixed the way I'd be hungry for air with a plastic bag over my head. Somebody uh, needs to register limbicbrain.com <laughs> really fast. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's just basic science. It's out there. Right. It's not, I didn't make it up. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So do you, do you see a lot of process addictions developing in addicts that you've been treating? You know, sometimes, I mean, I really focus on a holistic approach. So we try and avoid that by giving people like, you know, okay. holistic, you know, viewpoints, biologic, psychologic, social, spiritual, and nutritional. And honestly, I, I usually turf a lot of the process addictions to psychiatrists because I'm a family medicine doctor. And I think that that's a little bit more psychiatric based. But again, these are all new areas of medicine. These are things that we don't know that much about. There's more and more research being done, but we're all, you know, working together to try and come up with solutions to help people achieve their goals. It can be really hard. Which is why it's still so generalized, which is why you still almost have to generalize because it is so new. It's like you can't, you know, when you go to a 12 step meeting, a lot of times people say, well, they can't help this or they can't help this. They're, they don't have the ability to, you know, they have a, a singleness of purpose. It's, we got to go out at the top of the hour yeah. here, guys. Um, we do have a full hour, though, of clean radio that will be continuing. You're really getting professional. I am. This. I'm That's just trying just to. Like, uh, wow. Someone's got to counter you, Judas. Uh, so. <laughs> as you wear your Joy Division shirt. Yeah, Joy Division, my favorite band. Yeah, this yeah. is such a. Ugh. So anyway. Uh, give us the number, Judah. That's 877 your That's 877 And uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. This Talking song's heads. for you. This yeah. was, we heard this on the way down. Yeah. Wow. Okay, we'll see you in a few minutes. Ah, oh, there we go. Back to Clean Radio. Here we am. I'm Andrew with our co-host Judah. Welcome, Judah. Welcome, Andrew. Here we are in our new time slot. It's nine o'clock. Normally we'd be I know. leaving for the studio. I was right thinking now. about it. What am I going to do after the show? <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't have to race back home. Right at one in the morning. One in the morning. Try to fall asleep. Right. Without any pills. Without any pills. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's difficult. Yes. Yeah, try some chamomile tea. Chamomile knocks me out. You're like the one person that it actually works on. It right. works. My sister uh, is an uh, acupuncturist, and she also prescribes herbal medication. And she has sub prescribed some herbs for me that put me right out like that. Huh. Talking to Judah works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Self hypnosis. Like, you know what's funny oh about God. that? I think you so like, you're you totally lying about yeah, that no. one. Because <laughs> me talking to you makes you anxious. Yeah, right. right. Which isn't a good good for sleep. <laughs> and during the break, we were talking about people do have an addiction to tattoos. This is Judah's theory that people can be addicted to getting tattoos. Yeah, I think people can be addicted to get. I've heard that from people that have tattoos that it becomes addicting. Well, the pain's addicting, right? So, I mean, you're you're engaging in something that's re releasing some endorphins. Yeah, but it perhaps. Can't. I mean, I, yeah. I think people we don't know that much about, and I don't, I don't think the DSM five is going to include tattoo, tattoo addiction. addiction. I don't think right. that's ready for prime time. But <laughs> I mean, it's because I you don't have a lot of therapists with tattoos now. Um, any pr any <laughs> process can um, become disabling if it's if the pursuit of it gets in the way of the rest of your life. And that's why I don't think it's addiction. I mean, I think people can have. Um, you know, a desire to get tattoos, and it can be maybe disproportionate to desire to do other things that normally they would do. But it's just not something that I see as an addi a true addiction. Well, I don't, you know, I hear you, and but I think when you look at some of the extreme cases where people really change their appearance to the full point body that modification, right. they become like, they really I want to look like a lizard. Well, they limit horns, their the different yeah. opportunities that they're going to have in the future. But right. don't you think that some of that's an identity disorder? I mean, those are. But it could become you know, an addiction. I mean, look at the bride of that bride of Frankenstein lady that I can never remember her name. It was in New York. Bride she of was Frankenstein. They, lady. That's what they used to call her because she started to look like. You mean the Jocelyn Wildenstein? I think yeah, was her she, name. Yeah, yeah. The cat lady. The cat lady, and yeah, she, the, right. she, uh, she, she. I mean, the amount of plastic. What's her name? The one from the hills. I can't remember her name right now. Who, Angelina. No, no, from the hills. Heidi, I didn't say the Heidi, one that uh, has hills. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, what? Heidi. Heidi, Heidi Montag name? and. Yeah. Uh, Right. And uh, her, with her 18 procedures. Yeah, with her, her right. Whatever. And I mean, look at Michael Are you Jackson. An Us Weekly reader? Is this like, this is um, what our show is descended into? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> but Gossip. You don't think that's an addiction? That that is a form of they can't stop, it affects their life? I think that's, I think that's. No, uh, like, first of all, nobody's died from getting tattoos that I wear, I'm aware of. So I'd rather focus on like nicotine, alcohol, stimulants, opiates, the stuff that's killing people every day. That's what I worry the most right. about. I mean, because like we're. 
people are dying yeah every day and i think if people have body dysmorphic disorders which might be an indication if they're getting a lot of plastic surgery that they it's pointing more to that they have an identity disorder they have problems with the way they look they don't feel comfortable in their own skin they feel like they should be something that they're not and those do tend to lead to addictions people tend to also mask those same feelings with alcohol and we're and also drugs. you know we're, i'm sure many i'm listen i don't know this but i'm sure many of those people that have body dysmorphia issues probably are anorexic probably have you know bulimia and those things do kill they sure do. I mean, and I think that's when you think about addiction as being biologic, psychological, social, spiritual, and nutritional, that psychological and social point, right? That aspect of like where you fit in community. And, you know, our communities are so different today than they were 50 or 100 years ago. You know, it's, it's like it was an anomaly to actually have like a family that could survive as a nuclear family, just a mom and a dad and a kids being able to survive, being so affluent that they could survive. And now we have single parent families and single parent families where the single parent has to work all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like the social structures and the way that they're changing and the lack of support and the, and the, and the way people are interacting is everything is changing so fast that I think that um, individuals are a lot more susceptible to feeling terrible. And when they feel terrible, they want to feel better, which is natural. And then a lot of things they do to feel better end up being destructive. I actually did another radio show this morning where I was a guest. You which cheated was, on me? I cheated on you, Judas, sorry. <laughs> and uh, it, was, uh, it was actually a radio show about cheating ironically <laughs> <laughs> and um one of the things that came up was this idea that uh you know that uh like you were just saying that uh you know if you cheat or whatever that where was i going with this if, like you're the, pulling at me i'm pulling i'm pulling at you um, <laughs> does it really have you rubbing yes. off on me how did it happen social changes right so hell i don't even know what I was okay but about. i think i know where you were going since you, you did? did pull at me you, but okay. uh, <laughs> you know using that as an example and it's something i talk about a well, lot I have a friend that's about 60 years old. Um, not about, he's 62 years old. And um, he, uh, you know, he, he, I'm 20, I, I'm 35 and I got sober when I was 22. And I basically had all the years of my formative years, while they might've been a little stunted, I've somewhat tried to have catch up, but he's 60 and he never, and he found Facebook, let's say at 55. When he broke up with a girl, with a woman, he like, to him, it was like, you know, he would like look at her pictures on Facebook, see who she was dating. It was almost like, he, you know, the stuff that's supposed to happen when you're 16, 17 and 18 didn't happen and they were happening to him at the age of 62. And, um, you know, so I think so many people with the, you know, like you were saying, technology and all these things, it's, it's gone past us. And people haven't had their formative years. You know, you look like at Anthony well, Weiner, not to bring him up again, but he's a perfect example of somebody of a 47-year-old that was doing something that you should be doing when you're 18. And I'm not saying it's okay to send pictures of yourself when you're 18. Or you might not be developed enough to realize that it was wrong <clears throat> to do at 18. Right, when right. you're 18, you that right. Frontal lobe and, control. and you learn at 21, hey, that might have been a mistake. Well, but I think also your, your point is really excellent in that when you're wow. drinking and using, right, you're like psychologically out of town is sort of what I tell people and that you don't develop and also all the emotional things that happen to you while you're using you're not able to fully process so I refer to this as sort of like your unprocessed psychologic mail that builds up right I don't mm -hmm. know how much mail you get but I get a lot and when I go out of town I have to face a pile of it and you know, I have to actually go through and deal with whatever's there. And if you're using drugs and alcohol to deal with your psychological and social problems, that's sort of like using a shredder to deal with your credit card bill. Right. Right. It doesn't affect your balance. It just makes the bill go. Away. Well, I used to say to I mean, you and we had this discussion. You were saying about somebody, you know, that, you know, I used to say I used to think if I didn't answer the mail, it actually right. didn't come. Uh, it's just amazing to me on how many patients I get. Yeah. And then, you know, you go over to their house and you visit and they're just getting on treatment and there's that one giant cabinet just full of mail so, unopened so, for months you know? so the point is that when you stop using right you have to learn how to pay down your balance right you have to learn those psychological and social skills and that's why individual therapy and group support and social changes are so essential so that people can be actually comfortable after they stop using that tool of drugs and alcohol to cope with their psychological and social problems and there's well, so much fear I think I think addicts oh are, tremendous are in tremendous fear of what they don't know right that they've been avoiding it's like if you They're don't call the things that if they you don't, don't go to the doctor, if you don't go to the doctor, then you're really not sick. 
And generally, they find out it's not as bad as they thought right. it was. Well, it was my cavities. I, you know. <laughs> my cavities, when I got first got sober, I had right. like 19 cavities. <laughs> and I mean, it was the, my first sober summer. It was like the summer of the dentist. And... Um, <laughs> But that <laughs> all sounded like a really bad movie. Yeah, it was. It was, was starring. We saw sure on Dentures, man. On, on Lifetime. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> you like him, But you know, I mean, we were talking. We started with the show. You know, talking about Lindsay Lohan, and I'm, I was sort of joking that but she you should know be what? euthanized. She's still a 12 year old girl. I mean, this girl really. Every action that she does is that of a child. Because she has never progressed. Her brain, I mean, that's just my one, I, the doctor's I don't know. looking I mean, and saying that's not an excellent point. But I had one tonight. <laughs> but um, but it's, That's just so unfair. Okay, like, can you imagine the pressure of being sober, like, all by your, like, in that situation, if you really look at her history and know everything about her, and then you think about, like, every single thing that happens to her, everyone knows about all the time. Like, mm -hmm. the added pressure of that, I think, for people who are in the, in the public eye and what gets done to them, somebody's camping outside your house, taking a picture of you every time you leave, it's just... That's a choice, though. It's not their choice anymore. Once, once you make that jump, I mean, she was a musketeer. She was, she, she, right. she, she was, was a child. Right. She was, so and she has but that's, parents that but just that's what I'm saying. But I'm, I'm that. defending her, saying she's still a child. She's still dealing okay. with this stuff like a child would. Who goes in front of a judge with painted nail polish? You know, with, that says F U on it. I think that shows bad reality testing. I mean, she's at a point where you know she's impaired. Well, I think, and and I think it's a lot. We see a lot of this with. Uh, what I wanted to say was this radio show I was on this morning was um, there was a lot of younger people on the radio show. They were in their twenties, and I couldn't. You know, as I thought back, and it was about cheating, and I realized that of all the questions that they were asking me. They were all about themselves and their feelings and about what they would think about, like emotional cheating and, and what their thought of it. None of them were thinking about what it really did to anybody else. Right. And we really have become this me generation. I mean, there's been talk about the me generation for a long time, but I, I mean, this was the first time I was actually in a room of a bunch of 20 year olds. And it was really clear to me that they really didn't consider the other person. It was, is it OK for me? Am I OK with it? Well, it's like you know, the drunk like, driving thing. I mean, nobody's thinking when they when, when they drunk drive. Right. Am I thinking, okay with drunk drive? Right. As long as I'm okay with driving right. drunk, it's fine. It's not about whether Be it hurts because the, else. the the results of what ha might happen to somebody else doesn't even cross into their. Stream. But we see that sort of almost puritanical is, and it is almost puritanical thing that created that like harm reduction, right? Which we where we started with this. You know, a lot of people are opposed to harm reduction because they think it's enabling drug use. Right? Yeah, you're giving out needles, you're allowing people to come in, they overdose, they know they're not going to die, you're enabling them to use drugs. What do you think? I, d I disagree. I mean, I just feel like that it's impossible to control people uh, and what they're going to do. The supply side uh, drug policy and the drug war and all those things haven't really proven to be very effective. And I think that you know, the reality is that it doesn't matter how bad I want people to stop using until they want to stop using, they're not going to stop. Right. Mm -hmm. I can't make anybody do anything. I'm not here to divine, define people's goals for them. I'm help, here to help them achieve those goals. So. I just think it's a, it's a difference of philosophy. And also, remember, like, you, you know, there's a there's an, an ethical and a moral thing where some people really believe that addiction is a choice and that it's a moral failing. And I, and I disagree with them. Just like, the, but 50 years ago, people thought depression was a moral failing and it was a choice. Right. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Right. Come on. And now, you know, and then we really realized that, you know, depression had a medical basis. Which is one of the biggest reasons they named alcoholism and addiction a disease was to take the stigma, to take the moral stigma away. Because people weren't getting help well but they named it a disease because it is, is a disease. right but i don't know in the beginning how much that was my i had a therapist that actually did a whole thesis on this was that when they were fighting the ama well there are a lot of anti-disease model advocates still i guess stan right. peel is probably the most famous sure. right he wrote the diseasing of america which is sort of a diatribe on how there is no real addiction and that you know, um, what people are calling alcoholism addiction is really moral failings. So. I've, well, I've always had the thing on it where I like in the one of the books, it says it's an allergy. And for me, that always was, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with people that call it a disease. For me, I always understood the allergy. Like once it touched my tongue, I couldn't stop. I had to keep it very simple for myself. I think for me, I run into a lot of people when they find out I don't drink, everybody always has questions like why you know why don't you drink why why aren't you drinking you know and a lot of times i i'm comfortable telling people i'm an alcoholic but sometimes i'm not so i I've, I've gotten accustomed to saying that i have an allergy to alcohol yeah. 
uh, and people will still press, you know. So if I, I just say it makes me break out into bad choices. <laughs> yeah. You know what's or, really or funny? Or spots, spots yeah. like in jail a, institutions in the yeah, gutter. But what's yeah. really <laughs> funny though, because you hear that around the rooms in the twelve step rooms, a lot of people right. say that you know I break out in spots. Or my right. brother-in-law is actually allergic to alcohol, and he does break out in spots. I mean, he literally right. gets Hives. red. Yeah, yeah. Red, the big red blotches. Yeah, all I, of, I date a, a lot of Asian and guys, and Asian guys, their face gets red. Right. From from drinking. What is so that? There's a there's an enzyme, enzyme called right? alcohol dehydrogenase, and they and right. they just they have less of it, and so that they're not able to metabolize the alcohol appropriately. So toxic metabolites of alcohol build up and cause that reaction. That I actually works adorable. the exact <laughs> same way that antabuse works. <laughs> So if you, huh. if you have somebody oh, who wow. takes antibuse or disulfiram, really? that blocks that same enzyme. And so it makes it so that you, you get toxin metabolites that build up rather quickly. And cocaine and alcohol form a different substance when, it's, when they're used together, correct? That's right. In the body, cocaine and alcohol form cocaethylene, which is right. supposed to be, you know, two great tastes that taste great together. It's like peanut butter <laughs> and chocolate. <laughs> right. and it's, it's supposed to release even more dopamine than cocaine by itself. Huh. But that's your real attraction to Asian men, though. <laughs> the red face. Yeah, you were right lying here. to us on the drive. <laughs> <laughs> they said they can't drink that much. <laughs> yeah, cheap, right. dates. cheap dates. Cheap dates. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's very safe for you. <laughs> I, I tell them drink at home. Because there's nothing sexier than <laughs> rosacea. Over, don't drive. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We've now become a dating advice radio show. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but what I was saying before is I just, you know, uh, you know, w there is that thing, you know, they say a lot, you know, the age you started to drink, the age you got into your addiction is the age you stop growing and you know i mean i don't know how true that is i don't i mean what's your i, I think it's development you're uh, right your development your psychosocial development right so you know i think we see a lot of people that you know when they're hard to understand they're hard to understand their how they deal with situations and a lot of times i do you know i was saying to a friend of mine i had we, I, I knew a, a woman that was 44 and trying to get sober and i said to my friend i know she's 44 but we have we we have to look at her still like she's trying to get sober and mentally in some ways she's still a kid. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, there's just so many. Uh, it's I hate generalizations, and I you know I think it's so hard to say that you know you look at anybody and you say oh they're psychosocially arrested it you know whenever they started drinking uh, you know it's uh, not arrested it's blunted or stunted. Blunted. Or I think it's really and 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 in what way it's going to be different for each individual what. In their environment, what what areas did they still strengthen and develop, and what areas did they not strengthen and right. develop? But everybody's different, and that's I think that's if you carry that with you, it will help you so much. And I think the other thing is that everybody may need some different combination of biology, psychology, social, spiritual, and nutritional. One treatment by itself, be it biologic or spiritual or psychologic or social or anything, is may not work for somebody. So all of the above is always the best. One of the things we were talking about on the last break, which I thought was really interesting, is that you know, meth is is just so much more addictive than anything else we've ever seen. And you were saying it was like you it know, just releases a lot more dopamine, uh, a lot more quickly than any of the other drugs. I was, I mean, I was looking at this website uh, yesterday, and it had the faces of meth. Yes, and I've I, seen that. you saw yeah. that? Did you have you seen yeah. this? The before and after. <laughs> oh my god, it's amazing. Yeah, that is talk about scared straight. That should be shown in every. You but know. you know what's nice is the weight loss. The weight <laughs> just comes right off. So it's <laughs> along with the, and, along know, with all your health and teeth and, and your teeth. teeth. And, and, and you know, it's, teeth it, are heavy. It's <laughs> you know, but that's one of those things. I I had a I I I, 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 I was pleasantly plump as a kid. I lost weight when I was 16, and I remember one of my biggest fears of quitting drinking was that I was going to gain weight. You know, I was really, like, drinking normally makes you gain weight. It's all those calories in that. Yeah, yeah, but not when all you do is drink. <laughs> you know, in the yeah. end, yeah, your liver doesn't, uh, you know, is having a hard time and you become bloated. But, you know, when There's you're. a lot of calories in alcohol. But when you're an alcoholic, you're not really thinking, not you know, you're not really seeing straight. <laughs> you know, you look in the mirror, it's like that commercial. You remember the commercial where the guy didn't have his glasses on and he's like working out and he like, you know, you see him like flexing his arms and he looks great and then he puts his glasses on and he sees himself. <laughs> that's like getting sober. You look at yourself and you're like, woo. And that, that's exactly right because your limbic brain can affect your neocortex yeah. and it will come up with any story yeah. to get you to, to not quit. Yeah. To continue the use. Yeah. It'll say, oh, no, this will happen or that'll happen. Or you're going to lose this, or you're going to lose that, or these other terrible things are going to happen. It could all be lies, just to get you to continue to get that stimulus to I release the dopamine. I think it's hard for family members to really understand that, right? They they don't understand how the person that's actively using doesn't see what they. How see. could they? 
I mean, it's impossible. I mean, it's like talking to somebody that's an anorexic, that, you know, that thinks they look great. But a lot of times the family members are wrapped up in their yeah. own illnesses and their own, you know, all my, my whole family, with the exception of my poor mother, we're all alcoholics, hmm. you know, so she just overeats. She's... Well, that's, you know, that's as addiction as, that, I think food is one of the hardest addictions. Yeah, because you have to have yeah, it. Right, you food and to sex food. to me are two of the hardest addictions because they're the two things that you actually need. You have to moderate them. I don't know. I think cannolis are good. <laughs> <laughs> cannolis are good, but remember that, like, you know, uh, over half of Americans are overweight. And right. the people who produce the food and the choices that we make are not informed on how to keep people healthy. They're informed on how can you get the cheapest food that will release the most dopamine the quickest and get you to want to choose that food again. Right. And so with the advertising and the way the food is released – it is designed to get you addicted to it. Exactly. I mean, if you think about like what some, you know, like soda, for instance, like it's not necessarily it's any, candy. it's terrible for you, right? <laughs> and right. corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup is metabolized exclusively in the liver. So it's in some huh. ways, it's, you know, it, it, it's a toxin. How is that different from sugar? It's a, you know, concentrated sugar, right. you know, I mean, and like, so natural sugars aren't so bad, but like when you get these, you know, ultra concentrated sugars, they release dopamine, not as much as cocaine, right. but they still release well, dopamine fructose, and they affect right? the brain. Fructose is sugar in, veg in uh, fruit. Right? Correct. So why is it that people aren't, don't have the same sort of overall, I mean, craving for... Well, because think about the amount of sugar in an apple when you eat that apple with fiber and all the other things that are associated with it. When you eat the amount of sugar in an apple in your first sip right. of you know, fruit punch. Yeah. I guess you don't see people guzzling even fruit juice, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it would have a different effect. Um, if you were guzzling fruit juice, you might... Well, it causes diarrhea. Yeah, diarrhea, right. <laughs> but again... In other words, Judas tried this. But <laughs> <laughs> he was, 17, a, he was a, a great juice, juice so addict I mean, for, <laughs> for a week. Every time, like, once a year, a lot. For two nights, I'm a, I'm a grape juice addict. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, you know, I, you know, we talk about this once a week. You know, Andrew will splurge on something that he enjoys and partaking in. Like and a milkshake. And yeah. milkshake, you know, and the rest of the week you eat healthy. But the problem is how many people do live at McDonald's? How many people do, people do live at Burger King? Well, Everybody who's morbidly obese, right? Every day when they wake up in the morning, their brain still all day gets them to consume more calories than they can burn. Their neocortex knows that they don't want to be morbidly obese, yet they still consume that food. Why? Because their limbic brain can affect the way that they think and the way that they feel to get them to do it. It's the hmm. same basic issue as other substance dependence issues. It's just not thought of like that. And right. the food's cheap too. I mean, I live in yeah. a very poor neighborhood, and you should the the Beverly the, Hills, <laughs> <laughs> no Koreatown, and the grocery store where I the Ralphs where I were, uh, shop at. You should see these families pushing these carts full of processed foods and and soda and just sugary sugary stuff and and all the kids are fat and the mom's fat and the dad's fat and it's and they're, they're just buying these things because they're just programmed it's it's cheap and it's easy and it's that's right and know? it feels good yeah and it feels good it's very very reinforcing hmm. i gotta tell you though it doesn't feel good last night i i mean i i i constantly i drink diet coke which i'm not you know bright i know it's not healthy but i had a two liter bottle of coke it was gone by this <sighs> morning wow. and i was like oh this, this diet coke that bad for you i, I mean I drink is it coke constantly. one of your sponsors <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it isn't but i drink diet coke and i you know well, it's better than Pepsi, right? I mean, it's 99% <laughs> water. What could be in there that's all I had, It takes I, your body a lot of work to turn that bottle of Diet Coke into the bottle of water that it actually wants. So yeah. if you think about, like, giving it's your body... It's dehydrating, right? I mean, I know that. Well, it's not necessarily dehydrating. It's just it's extra work for your body to actually process that right. compared to processing water. But right. here's another question. Who cares? And it was, as some people might say, it's like, okay, so somebody's morbidly obese. It's their loss. And I'm, I'm not taking away from what it costs us insurance-wise... But yeah, so we're we've become an obese society. What are we gonna do? What are you gonna you know what, you know? It's like whatever. Well, I, I would say like Winston Churchill was morbidly obese. You know, would we want him on a diet? You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> maybe he would have lived longer and been able to help out more. <laughs> maybe, All I'm saying know. is that I think that the people who like the when we we live in an environment where 
our government is supposed to protect us to some extent from harmful products, right? And a lot of these products are a lot more harmful than they ever told us. Right. And they were designed to get us to consume more and more and more of them and without regard to our health. And, and this is your job, by right. the way, because you're a family. That's right. right. I'm a family medicine yeah, doctor. It, so it, my job it, is trying to get right. people to not and die. I, my, I mean, my, my dad teaches at Cornell and I, there was always this department of food science and I never really thought much about it. And then, uh, what do you think it was fact, like the Twinkie? I and just like, didn't really uh, get it. I was yeah. like, you know, why do they, what do they study? And then I found out that they like figured out how to make junk food and stuff. They yeah. would, act, they have, they had, so it really was yeah, the Twinkie. They literally had like departments where they w would make and figure out machines that would make like Cheetos. But again, that's a, you, know, you like, <laughs> but well, you're, but you see so you're, uh, uh, I don't want to get too personal, but, um, you know, I know somebody that, you know, they're very obese, their kids are very obese, and we're always wondering, does, does, what does their doctor say to them? It, you know, because it is the doctor's job to tell a parent about their kids. I think you have to tell them at every single visit that yeah. the most helpful thing you can do is lose weight. Just like whenever you see a smoker, you need to remind them at every visit, you know, one of the most helpful things you could do is stop smoking. Because you never know when somebody's neocortex is going to kick in, take control again, because it can, and start making different choices. And change is always difficult, okay? I'm not going to sit here and say that change is easy because change is di very difficult, but it is possible. And I think that it's a lot of it is just getting people moving in the right direction and giving them different tools. When I was a kid, I used to have a lot of problems with ligaments, tendons. I was a heavy kid. And one day when I was probably about 13 or 14 years old, I had a doctor named Dr. Grant, orthopedic specialist, a great orthopedist. And he goes, listen, he goes, you're right. Your tendons are bad. Your ligaments are a little. He goes, but there's one thing that's really going to help you. And he, I go, what? You know, I thought he was going to, he goes, lose weight. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my, I can't believe he just, it was the first doctor that ever said to me, you need to lose weight. Right, but you remember that. I remember and that, and two you. years later, I, I, it really did, because I, I you know, you, I, you, when you're heavy, you're in denial. You could create your own denial. It's no different than any addiction. It's what we were talking about. You look in the mirror and you don't see what, you know. And he was he was very honest with me. It's like my drug counselor that said to me when I, I was in rehab in upstate New York and I go to this drug counselor, I go, I could admit it I'm an alcoholic, but I can't accept it. And he goes, I don't care. He goes, <laughs> you know, you are one, whether you want to admit it, accept it. And he used different words. And, um, and it was the first time somebody in my life didn't baby me. And I think we are scared as sometimes we, we're scared to tell people the truth because, oh, my God, they might not like me. But I, well, I think America is a strange place as far as a culture. I mean, we have this very sort of um, Calvinistic, Puritan sort of, um, you know, religious sort of heritage um, that's, you know, very all about a sin based culture. And then we have this very libertarian cowboy free for all individualistic right side of America and the, those two parts culturally are always fighting you know you're free to do what you want you can do whatever you want it's the land of the free and yet we're also the land of the sinners yeah and and there's this cultural fight that we see going on all the time because it's and, within us it's the it's cultural fight and, and, it, right, right. and, it's and the I think we've is, manifested right. it as a culture within ourselves right. it, it, but it's also right how we how we view ourselves right it's how it's we a, it's the same as the battle between the, the front part of the brain right. and the limbic brain it's 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 exactly right. the same it's like uh, you know you have it's like the, the devil and the angel right. on your shoulder Right. Right. Exactly yeah. right. right. So freedom in America is the limbic brain system. And it's what we're, <laughs> and it, but it's what we were discussing at the beginning of the show, and we were saying, you know, it's like when you get sober, it's hard to, you know, you think, oh my, you have, still drunk driving is wrong, you know, and it's like because I got sober, I I, I can't look at certain things in a certain way, but there are certain things that are still wrong and right, and even though I thank God didn't you know kill somebody and I did it. It doesn't make me because I'm sober now to go. Oh, those you know, it's okay. You know, you'll it's progress, not perfection. Right. No, don't drive drunk. You know, don't kill somebody. Well, there this are is where we get into issues like legalization of drugs and, and harm reduction, right? I mean, should we really legalize and regulate all drugs? And there is a healthy medium. You know, like the the, the docs approach. You know, with with your um, with the needle exchange is far different than Canada's approach, which is a needle exchange and a nurse. No, they have a supervised no, have a supervised injection supervised. site, right. which actually is a whole, you know, like, and, and that's actually, the data suggests that that's been very helpful, gotten a lot of people into treatment and helped a lot of people get better. But remember, like, 
you know, in Santa Monica, you don't see a lot of people smoking crack on the street. In Vancouver, in that neighborhood where the injection yeah. site is, because I've been there, there's a lot of people yeah. smoking crack and they on had, the street. They had record overdoses and would we, in Vancouver, and that's why they started the needle exchange there, and because they were having the quality of heroin was going way up, and they had they just had record overdoses. Oh, really? so, Plus, they also yeah. have a lot of uh, morbidity from from abscesses, and you know, people losing their limbs from these infected abscesses, and, oh. and they just basically were like, okay, this is killing us. It's costing us tons of cash. Why don't we just give a safe place for people to inject if they're going to inject? And make the block really nice. And uh, well, I mean, just to sort of like you know, just reduce the harm that's going to happen from this. And 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 the data suggests that it's been quite successful. Right. And then they provided treatment actually. That's right. That. Made it accessible. Right. Hey, any you you want to quit this? Hey, you know what? Right. Just talk to this person there right here. Yeah. You just almost died. Maybe you might want to think about quitting. And that's one of the reasons why we started the free clinic as an offshoot of the needle exchange, because a lot of the people at the needle exchange wanted to get better, and there was no way for them to. They, there was no outlet. There's no, there was no medical component. Hey, if I, you're going to get drugs, if you're going to use heroin in a supervised clinic with a nurse standing over you, you're basically saying, I want help. I mean, because nobody in there, you, there, there is nothing fun to me about going, I can't, you know, it's just, it, is there anything right. fun about being right. like a long-term heroin user? They're like, not right. getting high right. anymore. They're like just getting therapist. better. It, They're just getting, right. I mean, the most, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I've interviewed thousands of heroin addicts, and basically what they tell me is there's no fun. The fun was gone long, right. it's long, chasing long ago. the dragon. It's, it's, right. No, they're not chasing yeah. it. They're just trying well, to survive, stay, right. stay well enough, avoid yeah. the fevers, chills, sweats, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, runny nose, water eyes, muscle pain, bone pain, joint pain, restlessness, agitation, insomnia, irritability, and craving that happens to them that incapacitates them <laughs> if they don't use it. You could have a competition, by the way, with right? that, <laughs> that car guy when you were a kid from the hotel. You know, we got the, <laughs> the Maxbox <laughs> hour. The FedEx guy. The FedEx guy. What do you mean? Do he does every commercial. He does every prescription drug commercial with the side effects. <laughs> it's a side job, right? Now. <laughs> oh Where do you goodness. practice, by the way? Uh, my private practice in Culver City. Uh, research is through UCLA and the free clinics in Santa Monica. What do you think about the internet? And in you know, now people can basically order online anything they want and get it from India. I think it's a little bit harder than it was. I mean, I know that the government's been cracking down on some of the internet-based pharmacies, mm -hmm. uh, certainly for the uh, opiate products, but. You know, I think that, again, like supply side drug policy probably doesn't help as much as we wish it would. Um, and I think that really, you know, I don't, that's not my issue. My issue is really with helping people who are trying to stop, mm -hmm. you because know, I don't, I don't see how to s prevent people from getting what they want. If it, if we, the more it's regulated, the more it goes underground, the more it's underground, the more like luc the more lucrative it becomes. Um, so do you think we should legalize drugs? I don't know the answer to that. I don't yeah. think that jail helps. You know, I haven't right. seen jail as being ultra therapeutic and also don't understand if addiction is a brain disease and we can offer people treatment before incarceration, how the treatment that we offer people instead of incarceration doesn't inc include any biology or any doctors. I think the problem is, is that people that become addicts end up engaging in criminal behavior to support their addiction. Right. Right. And then you have this weird dilemma right. where you have people that have acted criminally. I mean, that's what Prop 36 it, yeah. and well, I would know you PC 1000 and all those things are for, which, and I, I, I'm supportive of that but what we don't need is more people in jail we need and, and by the way most of these people who are incarcerating this is the meat of our earning population right. these are the people who are 20 to 50 who should be out there forming our tax base you know right. out there like learning trades and becoming like the next workforce and instead they're in jail they're not learning anything and they're learning how to be better criminals it's right. i don't see it as being wonderfully productive but here's the problem you're right you get you smoke a joint and you go to you know you, you there's if you kill somebody while you're high or you know you rob a bank there is you know and you are high which i i, I would venture to say most you know, nobody plans a bank job sober. I would just, I would, ha I would have to say that nobody, you know, all good idea, you know, no good ideas come after eleven at night. I don't think most people decide to, you know, to do certain things. But they are high and they are on drugs. They're probably drug addicts. They still need to, some people. Still, there is a level of people that need to be in jail. No doubt. You know, absolutely. You know, and that's the problem with the three strikes thing. It doesn't actually give a judge the ability to say, well, to, to judge the situation for himself and say, well, you know, your third offense was. Well, it's like our FBI profiler last week was saying that there are just sadistic people. Right. Right. There's some people that are just they're, sadistic. They're and bad people who bad do people bad things. No yeah. question. So I have a question for you. How many? I have a friend, actually. He uh, has a. A photo, a, a camera store. So he's constantly being bombarded by people that walk into his store and going, "I saw a better deal on Amazon." How many people walk into your practice after looking at WebMD and die and feel like they have the diagnosis for what's wrong with them? 
Well, first of all, 100% of the people who come into my practice already have the diagnosis made. Right? Okay. I'm addicted to alcohol. I'm addicted to crack. I'm addicted to opiates. You know, whatever it is. I mean, I, I don't do a tremendous amount of diagnostic dilemma. I do think the internet is a wonderful thing. I mean, I can't imagine trying to be a great doctor without the ability to look up uh, the information about the drugs that's constantly changing, to, be, to do computerized drug interaction scans, to look up areas of medicine and diagnoses that I'm not that familiar with. I mean, I, I feel like it's immensely helpful to me. And I think the more people are educated, the better. I mean, remember, we don't have a paternalistic medical system anymore where you know your doctor, they've known you since you were born, they know everything about you, and that they have this longitudinal relationship with you. It's very difficult for people to get time with doctors. And so it's it's important for people to become as educated as possible, to learn as much as they can about their illnesses, and to do as much due diligence as, as possible. So I think in that regard, I'm never annoyed by that. You know, it doesn't bother me at all. But it's also important that they not self-diagnose. But they're going to anyway. I mean, we can't stop them. And I think right. that, you know, that the reality is that people do need to go. Well, I mean, without. Well, we've gone in the reverse. Well, right? We've gone in the reverse. It used to be everybody listened to their doctor. Now it's everybody self-diagnosis. Well, what I think we're saying is yeah. it's probably good to educate yourself, but you should still see a physician. Absolutely. I mean, right. and I think, but also as a society, we should make that realistic for people instead of saying, oh, guess what? Only the top, uh, you know, half of society is going to get to have access to medical care and everybody else figure it out. But that same half doesn't have the internet. <laughs> everybody, has everybody has the internet yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Although there are still commercials for dial up for people that have dial up. Yeah, that's you know, for Judah. Yeah. That's because you don't pay your bills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to take a break. Well, um, on a, on a knock. Have a land <laughs> on a knock. <laughs> land. Well, we go to break on a <laughs> knock. Thank you so you much. Come back to Clean Radio and hear us pick on Judas some more. All right, 877-8830. We'll be back in a second. So, back here on Clean Radio. And we just had... Uh, the Judah go out for his nicotine fix? Always outing me. Right? Well, you know. Smoke but actually, things? Eric and I had actually an interesting conversation outside as he was inhaling my secondhand smoke. It was yes. delicious. And he chose to. <laughs> um, he, uh, you know, we were he talking about. Close, huh? We were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about, uh, you know, because the doc had brought up before about, we were talking about Lindsay Lohan and he was. You know, saying how there are people camped up outside your house, and Eric was saying, you know, he he had, you know, well, you well, I think it's, I think the the whole tabloid aspect of being a celebrity is such a an important part of being a celebrity these days. It, it's just, I I disagree uh, to a certain extent when people are complaining about being followed around by paparazzi. I think that that they have the the money and the. Uh, you know the no the where about the the wherewithal to go somewhere where they they can be in private and have a different kind of life but you know a lot of times these celebrities are calling people saying you know i'm going to be at such and such and i'm, I'm going to be here. at a meeting yeah you know and and i i so i just think with uh, in terms of lindsay lohan i mean i mean it's kind of sad that she's going through what she is going through in front of the eyes of of thousands of people um, but I also think that she's she's rewarded handsomely. She's compensated for all of that by the money that she makes and the opportunities that she has. And when I when I think about all the talented people that I'm surrounded by uh, daily in Los Angeles that don't have the opportunities that she's been given, mm -hmm. you know, and these are people that just work hard at their craft and are are salt to the earth type people and they'll, they'll never have the opportunities that she has and she she's just throwing it all away by jumping in a car just taking off down sunset boulevard and snorting coke all the way down it's just it kind of it irritates me it just pisses me off i think some that's that, that self-destructive nature of addicts i mean i think you know when people get desperate and they're you know they're just they don't you know they're looking whether they know it consciously or not they're they're wanting to get caught you know and, the, and she's surrounded by yes people too i'm sure yeah. she's surrounded by everybody saying whatever you want lindsay whatever you want i was thinking about that the want. other day like anybody that would drink with lindsay lohan right now is either an alcoholic or mentally disabled okay because if anybody uncaring right because I mean, if anybody right now would drink with her or use with her knowing that knowing what she has done i get it lower companion if somebody's using with her i get that but if you're if you're if you're not drinking and you're watching this girl drink and you're not leaving that apartment you know you, you there's some fame is very intoxicating i mean people change when they're around famous people you know 
I don't know, man. I feel like, you know, until you walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, it's hard to really put, you know, to judge them. And I try not to judge anybody. It's, I, it's clear that to me that she's suffering a lot and I feel bad but and here's help the, everybody who's suffering. But here's the yeah. problem is I, I, I get it that I, I, I understand we're not supposed to judge and we're not. I, I, that, but the problem is, is that people do look at her. That's where the problem in lies. It's like Reese Witherspoon. We spoke about this last week. Her great speech when she won the, what was it, the video, the blockbuster. Video music award. Right, and she said you don't have to, you know, do a sex tape to be famous. You right. don't have to do certain things. Well, people were actually, like, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the accolades for Charlie Sheen for being a coke addict. I mean, he's sitting there on TV saying that, he, you know, bang down seven grams of coke and like you know he's like some superhero for it right I and mean, it's ridiculous right but and so i think I, I think there has to be a counterpoint to to this behavior and that's just my opinion i think people do have to stand up eventually and say you know this isn't right you know this these you know i've seen far more famous people get sober i've seen far more pe famous people with paparazzi get sober and I think at a certain point, somebody, you know, it's when, okay, so maybe tough love. I don't, you know. I, mean, I don't think anybody's saying it's right. I just, you know, I think that like it's, you, you don't, it's just like any other addict who's doing any other thing that they shouldn't do when they're using. Okay. It's like, I, there's no, there's no value in picking it all apart. It's not okay. We realize that like, you know, people do a lot of bad things when right. they're using things that they would have never done. If Lord they knows I've using. done them. So and it's I'm like, not, so I don't spend a lot of time focusing on right. those things. What I really look at is like, what's it going to take for somebody to get better? And when I see somebody in that kind of situation, I think it's more difficult for them to get better than an average person of the same age that's with where the I, same intelligence and the same wealth in a different environment. I ha that's where I, I really have to, I mean, I respectfully disagree with you. And um, I mean, it's just from my experience, from my own experience of seeing people of far greater talent, of far greater celebrity, you know, I, I've met people that have had three homes that got sober. I, 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 I I think it takes moving out of Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, I really do. I think like if you're serious about it, then remove yourself from the situation and don't do it in the public eye. And she has the resources to do that. And I'm sure that's an addiction into itself, the public eye. You know, I, you know, people have to want to get sober. I, you know, as much as people talk about this, you yeah, know, I think you have to decide that you are not going to use drugs and you're not going to drink. And different this, people get to that that point in different ways, and it's still to some degree a choice. Um, I would, well, well, it's I, always to, a choice to get the and access the help right. to get to that point. Right. You know, you know. Well, when I first got sober, and of course I'm not a celebrity, but you know, I removed myself geographically totally to the east coast from ohio and but i literally at the time thought well i'm just going to go there and they're going to teach me how not to drink and then i'm just going to go back home and live my life you know <laughs> but once i got up there i realized you know the fog cleared very quickly for me and i realized that i wanted the resources of a of boston and, and that is the benefits of a treatment center is that you do need sometimes to take yourself out of the situation yeah. i literally I, I remember breaking up with my boyfriend on a from a payphone in a rehab, I'm like, how Carrie Fisher can you get? <laughs> <laughs> and to people that don't get that, great movie postcards from the edge. Indeed. <laughs> and uh, yes. And, and there's no question that like residential treatment, higher levels of care can be life saving. Okay, but I mean, you know, each person, what combination of treatment modalities for what duration is going to be different. And I think that it's like, you know, just because, you know, the plural of anecdote isn't data. So experience of one plus two plus three plus four doesn't necessarily mean that it's generalizable to everyone. I think it's that's why you have to look at each person as an individual and craft a plan that will fit them in their life that they can actually implement in order for them to have the best possible chance of sustained success. And I think, mm -hmm. too, when people ask ask me, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what advice would I give, which I hate, you know, but people will often ask me that my advice is you never give up, never, ever right. give up. Don't ever stop trying. My last, I smoked for 18 years and my last 10 years of smoking, I tried every three months to quit smoking. Right. I tried over and over and over and over again. Thank God that I kept trying because finally one, to one it stuck. Finally, you know, and if it if it hadn't, I'd be living a very different life right now. If I was still smoking, mm -hmm. I'd be I, who knows if I'd even be here. I was smoking over two packs a day, uh. you know, every day. But you're right, though. I mean, going back to Andrew's point, it is a choice. In the end, it comes down to whether you want to stop or not. 
you know, and I think, you know, that's when you, and that's when everything will come, you know, if you want to get help, that's when there is help out there, but you have to want to stop in order to, you know, get that help. Yeah. Amen. The patient is the quarterback yeah. and the captain and the coach of the team. Right. They determine which players are on the team, which players are right. on the field, and every play runs through them. So I can have the greatest ideas ever, but if they're not willing to implement them, it's which irrelevant. most alcoholics and addicts do when they're using. And uh, but you get the you know they used to say the not drinking part is the moose, you know you get to not drink and then change. It's very hard to change and then not drink. I also think a lot of things happen outside of treatment. Like, uh, you know, a lot of people come in to my treatment center and they say, let me see the group schedule, you know, like, when do they get this treatment? When do they get that treatment? And like, that's when it's going to happen. And, you know, one of the first things I say to them is, you know, a lot of this stuff happens after group when they're right. sitting alone. You know, they might hearing about it and, huh. and incorporating it into their thought process. It's the, it doesn't happen necessarily when you're told something. It's funny because I remember my rehab experience. I don't remember one group, but I remember playing spades with the people in rehab and the bonding that we had playing hearts or spades and meaningful interactions yeah. between humans releases dopamine number one and number two recovery is a process not an event right it doesn't happen like that it's not something like that it's something that takes time and it's a constant thing it's evolving over time it's every single day making that choice today i'm not going to drink today i'm not going to use today i'm not going to smoke whatever it is and i think that's one of the things that people need to understand is that it's and that's why i talk about longitudinal disease management treatment over time sticking with it it's not a discrete thing it's not like just remove the bullet and i'll be all better get the drugs out of my body detox me and i'll be all better that doesn't work i think that's one of the biggest reasons they have alan on groups too which is for the family members is because they want them to understand that yes your husband stopped drinking your child stopped drinking but it doesn't mean they're going to be all better right now that this is a process that takes a long time recovery is a lifelong process Indeed, and it's it's learning to live life on life's terms. And I remember too, like a lot of times within my first year of sobriety, you know, a lot of times you you just become so focused on yourself that you forget that life happens, you know. And and I remember within my first year of sobriety, a very close friend of mine died, and I was so shocked by that, you know, initially because like, oh wait a minute, you know, life is happening. People people are coming and going, and this is what's going to happen, and I'm going to have to deal with it without anesthetizing myself, without taking in alcohol you know i'm gonna to have to learn how to deal with these things yeah you know i i find most people that are using in in especially drugs especially the more potent drugs we see now have some level of suicidality to their their behavior and their thought process and you know we're seeing more and more dual diagnosis clients as well um these drugs are so strong we're seeing you know drug-induced psychosis and and uh, you know, vascular dementia is occurring quicker and quicker. What is vascular dementia? It basically has to do with uh, changes in blood vessels, which cause changes in brain function. Uh, and so, you know, it's biological. There are major biologic changes associated with exposure, chronic exposure to alcohol and drugs, which can radically change the way the brain works. And you know, if you don't have the right combination of therapies it's unlikely that you're going to get better on your own. I mean, that's kind of my point about the brakes. If your brakes don't work, when you hit the steep left turn, no matter how bad you don't want to go off the road, you go off the road. Right. Okay. And that's like about a picking the right road B, you know, like knowing that you don't have brakes and saying that I can't go there. Um, and then see, like making sure that the environment doesn't push you to, Oh no, you're okay. You can do it. It's a tough deal. Yeah, that is. But also, it's a great analogy because I've actually never heard that before. Somebody saying the small breaks, the big breaks. That is a good analogy. Yeah, and like I was thinking, like the people that get sober young, you know, like we did, our bodies are definitely different. Our right. bodies definitely reacted to alcohol differently than people that get sober when they're, you know, that could handle drinking till they're forty. Because right. I physically couldn't so, do it. So the the science behind that is that the the braking system is the GABA system. Gamma aminobutyric acid is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter system in the brain, and you know when when your brakes don't work, it's a lot harder to make great decisions. You know. So, but let me. But what is the difference though between somebody, you know? Physically, our bodies are, are you know, obviously our, everybody's body is different. So the people that get in here when they're younger, 
their bodies could not keep functioning at the same pace that other people's bodies could. You know, again, it's like it's impossible to generalize, right. but like so there are all there's all sorts of things that we know. Like one thing we know is that the more tolerant you are to alcohol and drugs, the more likely that you're going to become dependent. So the person who can drink one drink and they're loaded, they don't turn into an alcoholic as frequently as somebody who can drink 40 drinks. Right. Okay, mm-hmm. because like more toxin causes more damage. Um, and so I mean I just hate to generalize, right. but I think that there is there are certain people who they get exposed to drugs early on, and and they have a profound biologic difference in the situation. However, you don't know what their psychological, social, spiritual, and nutritional backgrounds are, and that may play just as big a role. They may you know be from a shattered home. They may not have any con- unconditional love in their life. They may be surrounded by people who are drinking and using. So, the, and I just I hate to speculate because you just never know whether it's the problem is biologic right. or is it psychological or is it social or is it spiritual. It's probably a combination of all of the above. So, Eric, after you stopped drinking, did life get better for you? Oh, my gosh. Yes, immensely. Immensely. And I I realized very early uh, in my sobriety that, uh, that, sure, the tough things were going to be tougher because I wasn't anesthetized, but the things that were supposed to feel good felt better because I was able to feel them. I was able to feel love. I was able to feel uh, joy, you know, and, and that that with my smoking that was a big one too like I it was very dramatic for me the first day I can remember clearly of when I was not smoking and I was smoke free and I smelled something in the air and I I'm like what is that and I realized I was smelling flowers for the first time in my life I was right. organically smelling a flower and I was 32 years old you know like and that was really dramatic for me and and I I've my life has been filled I've been lucky and blessed to be filled with moments like that where I'm able to feel this joy and and you know it's not all uh, roses you know like I've I've had a lot of things that I've had to deal with you know but I'm lucky and I consider myself extremely blessed and I, I thank God. I really do. Amen. I mean, the pain is part of it, right? Like, you know, the pain and suffering is part of life. It's just going to be there. But, you know, so is the joy and the happiness and the, and the wonderful things. Indeed. And that, that pain, you know, it sounds very trite and cliche to say that it makes you stronger. But it makes you stronger. You, you can become... Uh, you can kind of rise above it and it adds to you. It adds to your, to the person that you are, you know. I was raised in a very abusive home, you know. My, my dad was just a very nasty, mean man, you know. But, but I took from that uh, a sardonic twist uh, 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 perspective of life that kind of helps me now, you know, in my comedy. Most of the time, <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe also it's funny. Because they, I mean, most addicts and alcoholics believe pain could kill them. I mean, it is the crazy, unrealistic fear of most alcoholics and drug addicts is that pain. And I will I, to generalize that is a belief they have emotional pain. Yeah, that emo- like my feelings can kill me, mm-hmm. and I believe m- m- many you know people relapse on that fear. I'm not going to say all, but I believe many people, you know, when they have those days that are, you know, so filled with emotions, they can't handle it. Yeah. You know, I think that people are suffering and that they are trying to fix themselves a lot. You know, self-medicating is a real thing. Unfortunately, for a lot of people, it's just it it isn't the answer anymore. There's no way to effectively self-medicate. And that's why many times people get sober because it's not working anymore. I think that's why, you know, people that say, oh, how could you become an alcoholic or how could you become a drug addict don't realize that that how easily people can get trapped by self-medicating. It can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone, right. And people really, but there is a stigma out there that, oh, you did it to yourself. And, you know. But I mean, I, I remember the first time I met somebody who was like in their in their fifties and they had built this business and they had this wonderful family and they had this functional relationship with alcohol their whole life and then at fifty eight there's a bottle of vodka in the sock drawer. What happened? How does that happen? What you know like 
it just didn't make any sense. And I, you know, and, I, and the way I think about it is, you know, your braking tone works until your brakes don't work anymore. Right. And you know, and slowly, 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 your braking tone starts to dissipate. And then at a certain point, you know, your limbic brain gets the overhand, the upper hand on your neocortex, and it starts calling the shots, and you start doing something bad. And the reality is that people are constantly battling their limbic brain, whether it's food or sex or earning or alcohol, drugs, nicotine, stimulants, name it. You know, so. It's a battle for everybody all the time, and it's like, you know, doing the right thing for you every time. I mean, a lot of this must be overwhelming for our listeners. How do people create balance? One person at a time. I mean, it's just about, like, trying to, like, and keeping it simple. And, like, if it starts with just keeping alcohol and drugs out of your body, just stick with that, you know, and then everything else will get better over time. And bad things can happen. It can be ridiculously difficult. I get it. But if, you know, if you have the problem, um, continuing to use is not going to help. I also think there's a fun and spiritual thing to all this. It's like, you know, we're talking about food. There is a certain fun and spirituality to changing your diet. You know, to learning how to cook for yourself, to learning how to do certain things instead of going to, you know, Chuck E. Cheese or McDonald's and that being your diet. There is something very cool about going on, like we were talking about, going to Whole Foods. And, or uh, even even drinking enough water. I, yeah. I People do not drink, drink enough en- water. Yeah. And you, you'd be amazed how good you can feel if you just drink enough water. These guys are drinking Coke, Diet Coke, I know, and I coffee. Know. I never drink soda, though. This is like this the worst This soda. is a treat. He's I just seen the excitement he <laughs> had at the gas station. Like, <laughs> at the gas station before the show, he's like, I can, I get a can I have a real Coke? Yeah, can I have a real Coke? Yeah, I was dude, like, yes, don't know. Of course you can. I'm going to break out the show tunes. Of course you can. <laughs> so that's what Coke will do for you. We are running out of time, by the way. I know. Way. Well, thank you. we got to thank our guests real quick. Yes. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me. And I, people I can fun. see you again where real quick? Uh, all over town, all over L.A., but uh, Tuesday at the Yambar at uh, Fountain and Vine. Great. And Fixter. And Dr. Torrington, thank you so much for coming <laughs> yeah, all the way down here. My right. pleasure. Thanks and for having me. And your practice is in? Culver City. And people can reach you over the internet. Maybe. Or hit, or hit cleanradio.com, <laughs> and we'll have a link. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, thanks, listeners, and we'll see you again next week at 8 p.m.